question. It is, what is our role in perversion? Why has the church allowed it? And do you think we are responsible for the United States being plundered into it because of our unspoken participation in it? And how do we fix it? I'm going to read the question one more time. What is our role in perversion? What has the church, uh, why has the church allowed it? And do you think we are responsible for the United States, we're talking about the church, being plundered into it because of our unspoken participation in it? And how do we fix it? I want to throw the question first to Pastor Eric Thomas. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me say this. Um, I, I believe that uh, our role ha has been very important in, when you speak of the word perversion. Um, it's in the church. We, we, we may not want to admit it, but it's in the church. And I'm not saying that everybody um, is participating in perversion or is perverted, but it is in the church. I think it is the lack of sound teaching, sound doctrine. Um, keeping up with the Joneses. There are ministries that never talk about perversion. There are ministries that never talk about sexual sins. I think it goes back to Grounds Roots gospel that we have to preach everything. Um, we are afraid in many times. I'll, let me just speak personally. Uh, I have gays in my church. Um, and so the challenge is we don't want them to leave and because social media, because social media has made it okay, because the language, or I should say, not the language, but uh, they have a louder voice in many instances than the church. And because perversion is almost the norm now. And we have to, as a church, I believe, um, we have to challenge this, and a lot of us are afraid of challenging it because we don't want to lose them. Um, I, have, I have, again, I have it in my church, and sometimes because of the culture change, because I have the older people in my church who are sanctified to the bone, they don't want to see them in the, you know, they don't want to see them in the choir. They don't want them in the church, period. But the whole mung and deacon is okay. The people who cheat on their taxes, they're okay to stay. So because, uh, because now um, it is an attack on perversion, no matter what it is, not just gays, just fornication, adulteries. Now it is viewed as the lack of love. They don't love me. And so many times the church is afraid of being attacked on social media. And so we hold back the truth. I think we are, prophet, we are somewhat responsible because of our lack uh, of speaking the truth, even if it gets us in trouble. You know, uh, Pastor, that is really good. And I could say something right there, but I'm just moderating. So I'm just going to give us the body definition of perversion as we, because we're not done here. Uh, it, the perversion is the alteration of something from its original course, meaning or state to a distortion or corruption of what was first intended. So the question part B is Bishop Rocket and then Bishop Sion. How did we become responsible for that distortion of what was originally intended? Well, first off, I don't believe the church is responsible for perversion because if you go back to the Apostle Paul, he addresses the church of Corinth and says, I heard that there is fornication amongst you. So in other words, there's nothing new under the sun. This stuff has been going on since the very beginning of the church. So it wasn't through social media that he heard it, but through Pony Express, <laughs> they sent a letter and said, these folks over in here are getting busy. And so Paul had to address it and told them, 
to flee fornication. Okay? But Paul wasn't around to get in their, in their bedroom and, and monitor what they were doing. He preached the word of God. And I believe that that's what we are called to do. I'm commissioned to preach the word of God. You're in sin, I'm preaching against it. You're in, you're in fornication, you're in a homosexual relationship, you're doing uh, all kinds of perverse, perverse things. My job as the preacher is to preach against sin, is to call people and point them back to God. So I don't believe we've allowed it. Now, I do believe that there are some people who have compromised the message of the gospel, have dumbed down uh, our approach because of the fear of members leaving, of the fear of tithes and offering going down. Well, my pastor's at in here. We've, go, we've, got, we've gotten to the place now where we don't speak against things because we're afraid of what it might mean culturally. But the, the reality is, is that Christ called us to be a witness. And the root word of witness is a martyr. That means that I'm willing to die for this gospel. So in other words, I got to be willing to preach it even if Facebook crucifies me, even if Twitter comes against me, I got to be willing to speak against it for the cause of Christ. Amen. Uh, so when you deal with perversion, I think everybody has eloquently dealt with it just from a love perspective and from a, you know, a perspective of those that are struggling with perversion, I think part of the, the, the issue where we've dropped the ball is just understanding perversion. If we understand it, we will know how to deal with it, meaning it is something that is twisted or something that has gone off its original course. So let's go back. Why does the enemy want even a man and a man to get together? Why does the enemy want a woman and a woman to get together? And then you can go into um, the adulteress and the, the, the pornography and all of these different things. When you first deal with just that one sector of homosexuality, it is because what was man and woman's intent in the first place? Well, when I talk about perversion, though, Bishop, I'm really just not talking about homosexuality itself. I'm talking about anything that has been twisted from its so original intention. Okay, great. That's, that's where I'm going. So that's why I mentioned the lust, the pornography, yes. and all of those things, because what the Word of God is meant to do is bring forth fruit. Absolutely. All right? And I think that we have not understood that the door has been opened for perversion in the lives of people because the pulpit has been opened for perversion of truth. So when we don't preach the truth, you, the, the archbishop teaches us, the pulpit is the womb of the church. All right. When you are perverted in what you preach and you don't preach truth and straight gospel, um, when you are compromising the things that you preach, it does not bring forth the fruit that it's supposed to. Hence, the door is open in the church. We're not talking about the world in the church for perversion to go forth. Hence, things get off course and we begin to do things and you see just a decline in every area uh, of not just people's individual lives, but go back to the culture, in the ministry period, it just does not look the way it's supposed to look because perversion has come in. We do have people who might be interested who are viewing us online. We are online. If you have questions, post your questions. We do have someone that is actually going to read your questions during the period of time. And in a moment, we'll take some of those questions as they arise. Bishop Ron Woods. Well, I, I totally agree with what everybody said. However, you can preach holiness all day, but if you're pointing at me because your pants so tight, how am I hear it? You get what I'm saying? These fellas dress in a certain type of way to attract a certain type of people, and then when that spirit is unleashed in the church, they want to say, well, I don't know how to fix this. Well, you know how to fix it. Fix your pants, first of all. I don't want my woman looking at you. I want her to hear Jesus. Oh. <laughs> Just keep it real. You know, and we, and, and we, that, that, that is a serious thing. See, that's very yeah. powerful and profound is yeah. because sometimes as church people, you know, that yes. we, we, we can act so innocent. Yes. So the question is, in yes. context, what is our role? Our role, first of all, we made robes bad, all right, and we made tight pants good. Because of change of culture. Because of the change of culture all right. according to the world. So now we warm it up. But not the church. And we damn the woman that shows cleavage. 
but we got these body shirts on. Huh? You got these fellas? So part them. of the question is, why has the church allowed it? Because the preachers are allowing it. If you wrapped up in perversion, how are you going to preach somebody else out of it? If you're walking around with a limp, how are you going to tell some other man he got a limp? We beat on people and we abuse them because we're abused. Bishop Rocket. But I, 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 He's just know, I, itching I, for a response. Come on, Bishop. I, I, I think it goes even beyond what you're wearing because, because, honestly, even when you talk about robes and all that, that's cultural. Okay, if you look at the historicity of all of that, that goes beyond, uh, that, that has nothing to do with holiness. Robes were worn actually in the early, uh, in the early church as a sign of status and a sign of wealth and the money that you had. So that's where, you know, all the robes and stuff, that has nothing to do with holiness. That had to do with culture, status, which Jesus actually preached against, but that's another topic for another time what we really got to deal with i think is you talk about perversion i think going away from the original intent of what we were supposed and what we are called to do i think the church has has lacked the intent of lifting up jesus and that being our central objective lifting up jesus said and i if i be lifted up will draw all men unto me. So our, our, our process and our premise now has been lifting up ourselves, lifting up a church, trying to build big edifices and congregations, and we've gone away from the original intent. We perverted what our true message should be, and that's just Jesus. You know, I believe that we are in an intellectual age. We're in an information age, right? Uh, I did a study on millennials that says that 60% of millennials practice religion, 60% in the United States practice religion from a mobile device. It is because for some reason they have become disinterested in church culture, all right? So when we talk about lifting up Jesus, preaching Jesus, there is a remnant who do. Many of us in this room, if not all, who are preachers, senior pastors, senior leaders, do preach an authentic message of Jesus. But it does not negate the reality of what we're seeing surface on social media platforms. Because the reality is, every time we hear great testimony about the church and a move of God, here comes a cloud of controversy. And who's caught up in the mix is church people. So how do we deal with that Bishop Sion Roberts? Or Bishop Archbishop George Shirt? And then we'll get you next, Bishop Shirt. So... Um I guess you kind of threw a curveball because I took the mic for something else, but I'll, I did, I did, I, I, okay. So it sounded like this question had two parts and, and I think yes. we we're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. So we talked about what was our role in, in perversion, in the perversion, allowing it, but like now that it's here, what yes. is our role? What are we going to do? What are we going to do to fix it? So I think that that is, he talked about lifting up Jesus, but Je Jesus gave us the example. And I think, um, Pastor Thomas was, was trying to hit on this as, as well. One of the things that we do that I think hurts us more than anything is we crucify people who are caught up in it. So now that it's here, okay, we know perversion is wrong. We, we've had some that, that, that have talked about on this panel how it got here. Now that it's here, what do you do? And Jesus showed us there was a woman who was caught in adultery, right? And they brought her. And what we have done is we will hit certain people over the head and crucify them and let others go free. When, when we don't understand that it's not about covering anything, it's about what you love, not what you cover. So when you love even the people who are caught up in perversion, you love them to freedom because the truth shall make you free. Mm. So the, you cannot separate the truth from love. When you love somebody, the Bible says he chastens those that he loves. So that don't mean you're not speaking strongly to them. It just means I know that if you speak strongly to me, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. So if I know that you love me, you can say whatever you need to say to me to bring me to deliverance. But I think one of the missing ingredients in the church is unconditional love. We have learned how to do church. We have learned how to preach. We have learned how to even have order. But we have forgotten, in my opinion, how to really love somebody who's down and love somebody who's caught up in stuff. That's good, Archbishop Shorts. 
Yes, I feel that the church is a condemning message. We condemn everything. We have no love. We have no concern. People out there in sin or in perversion really don't want to be there. They just don't know how to get out. And someone abused them, which caused them to be the way that they are. We have to understand the kinds of demons we're dealing with in this age. It's not the same demons that we dealt with in yesteryears. This is a new kind of demon, a new kind of, of principalities and powers. We've got to understand the age in which we're living it. It's a churchless age. It's an age of self. It's an age of self-gratification. How do we deal with it? We've got to go down in prayer. We've got to understand what we're doing. See, you need to know your demon that you're dealing with. Jesus said to the man that came that was cutting himself, he said, identify yourself. What is your name? Find out the name of the demon you're dealing with. Find out the origin of the demon. Find out how it got that way. And then you can deal with it. Woo! Shebrasa. My God, what is your name? Where did you come from? <laughs> yeah, that's good. So I'm going to throw this at you in the Bible. It says, and for this call, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. It says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So now that God has sent strong delusion, what is our responsibility as preachers or as the church as it relates to culture and having them believe otherwise. You all keep throwing me these hard ones, amen. Right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we're going to have to be authentic. I think that is one of the words that comes to my mind. We have to be authentic. Uh, we, we, I believe what's happening is because, and the Bible says, because they would not retain God. Mm that some of them, amen, I believe a lot of folk are borderline reprobate. Yes. That's what it said. It said that he gave them over to a over reprobate to. mind. Yes. And so, so, so we're going to have to, one, we're going to have to get back to basic stuff, deliverance. Yes. Um, because this is what this generation needs. They, need. they need deliverance, which only comes through the word of God. And in order to do that, we're going to have to be able to discern where they are. And somebody said it on this uh, platform, that we're going to have to find out why they are like they are. Go, uh, Archbishop, why they are like they are. But we need more than just a cute sermon to, in order to deal with that. Uh, you'd be surprised at the people who sit across from my uh, desk uh, who have some horrible stories that led to the reprobate, that led to the stuff. You will hear about many of them who were introduced to this stuff from people in the church. And so in order to deal with that demon, we're going to have to deal with it from love. The Bible says, and I always tell my church, that every gift that we have is governed by love. The Bible says the whole law hangs on two things, loving God, loving man. And I believe in, our, in, in the prophetic, it has to be love that governs that. And I think... In, in, in some instances, it has not been uh, from a place of love. Not everybody, but Pastor, uh, Bishop uh, Robert said that we're going to have to love people and, and, and really ask God for an eye of discernment because this generation, hey, look, they're just not going to come to the altar because you say come to the altar. We need some power to draw them to the altar. And once they get to the altar, I told the church the other week, Hey, it's okay to call out demons, but if you don't have the power to deal with those demons, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Jesus said this. The Bible says the woman brought her child, her, the woman brought her child to his disciples. 
his, his boys, the one that was in his circle. They and the Bible says ready. they could not do anything because they weren't ready. They did not have power. And in order for us to get this generation back, we're going to have to have the power of God because that is what, that is what separates us from everybody else. They want to see power. They've seen church. They know how to do it. That's why they stay home because they want something that they're not, they're not getting all the time. And so if we're going to really get them uh, delivered, we're going to have to have that power that Jesus talked about that comes by fasting and praying. Amen. I want to, I want to, uh, I want to read this question that Nikki Green has uh, on social media. She says something into relation to one of the panelists, and I just wanted to go back to that is because I do want to talk about clothes. Uh, says, don't focus on the clothes. Focus on how the church can enrich the people's lives. Clothes are a minor thing. So Nikki asked that question. So in relation to clothes, as it pertains to the church, and I don't want us to move into the discussion of robes versus no robes and all of that. I really want to talk about the changing times and culture. Should we begin to look like the world in order to attract them? Should it be our attire or should it be the word of God? I, I think that, God bless you, Nikki, but I, I think, <laughs> uh, and you gotta understand, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of that because I'm, I'll be 40 in two weeks and I grew up in the old school church. Thank you. So I grew up in church like Greater Harvest where they was there all night, amen. That's why I like you on Sunday nights at eight. But, uh, Nikki, I, I want to pose a question to her question, to everybody, because clothes don't matter is the, the call of the day for some people in some reformations and some. But if I came in here butt naked, then it'd be a problem. Clothes, clothes matter. So, 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 <laughs> bitch, I was bitch say, what? You ain't got to worry about that. Ron is not going to do that. But. The question we is... We say clothes don't matter. Focus on the soul. Focus on love. But to some degree, that in holiness, there is a way. There is a standard. Uh, and the Bible calls it being decent and in order. And you can be fully covered up and out of order. You see what I'm saying? Uh, we say, well, he's fully covered, or she was fully covered, but she had on a cat suit. So let me ask you a question. So she's not in order. Let me, let, me ask, let me ask you a question. You or anyone on the panel can address this. I mean, this is a serious question. When you look at social media and when you look at the view of what these church services are looking like, it is obvious that the image of the church is changing. Yes. And to be really, really honest with you, it's changing so fast is that we really can't tell social culture from church culture. Yes. So my, my question is... Uh, are we trying to be relevant to a fault or are we just trying to uh, use social tools as a mechanism to draw? But when we draw them in the church, how do we influence real change in their lives? I, I want to say this real quick, real quick, because my service starts at 2. So I have to be there about 1.30 and I'm resting. I watched four to five services between 8 a.m. up until the time I got to church. And I counted the times I heard the name Jesus. I counted the times I heard the name the blood. I counted the times I heard the word deliverance. I counted the times I heard the word breakthrough. Collectively, less than 60 times between all five services. Now, I wasn't watching Powerhouse, of course, but, uh, but, but all five services big churches. You see what I'm saying? Great amounts of people, amazing music, great orators, but not preachers of the gospel. Because how can you preach the gospel and not mention the blood? How can you preach the gospel and not mention Jesus? I know everybody knows about what's going on now. How can you preach the gospel and not mention prayer, deliverance? These are words, terms of the church, but they're also rights that we have. We have the right to Jesus. We have the right to deliverance. We have the blood of Jesus. And when we take the terminology out first, then you change the way the dressing, 
then you change the music and they're singing about celestial beams in the sky that come down, you know, with UFOs and, and not the blood of Jesus and how he heals and how oh y'all act like y'all don't know. Well, Stop Bishop, with Bishop, me. you actually just took me to the point that I okay, was going. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and the reason that's very good, and I'm going to read this. Judge Christina, Christina Snyder ruled that the cross should be removed from the Los Angeles seal, citing it was unconstitutional because it considered sectarian imagery. The definition of sectarian is concerning or relating to sex of religious imagery. The cross set on top of the historical mission San Gabriel Archangel, which represents the historic role of the missions in the settlement of Los Angeles region. Now, I read this simply because social community doesn't like sectarian imagery, meaning that when they walk in your church, they don't like to see crosses, the altars are old, we just find stages and lights now, right? Nothing that reflect crosses. The reason why people don't like to see sectarian imagery is because sectarian imagery tells them that they need a savior and that they are a sinner. All right. So could it be because of the pressures of the social arena, we are adjusting our messages, removing Jesus' name, removing items that's familiar to the fundamental ideas and traditions of the Church of Jesus Christ. Archbishop Shorts. It is a spirit of deception. We are all being deceived because when you take certain things out of the church, it's no longer the church. We're fooling ourselves. If the cross, the resurrection, and the name Jesus leaves the church. It is not a church. We can't have the church without certain symbols that represent the church. It's founded on Jesus, not culture. Not culture, but Jesus. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw then he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. How are you going to move the pulpit? You can't pull no person out of the pit without a pulpit. How are you going to move the altar? If the person ain't becoming a sacrifice, they can't be cleansed. We are deceived. This is the spirit of deception. Bishops, archbishops, pastors, churches are being deceived. That is the spirit of the demonic forces of this day in time. Deception. My God, Jesus. Let's go back to delusion then, Bishop Sion Roberts. Somebody come on and praise him right there. For the church, don't let this stuff change what we do, who we are and who we represent. Somebody shout up in this place. Let them know that we stand on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Hey, we can't be ashamed to proclaim him. Hallelujah. Hey. Hallelujah. Oh, shout up. It's still Jesus. I don't care what nobody said. I said it's still Jesus. Somebody ought to give God a radical shout right there because it's Jesus all day long. Hallelujah. Every group today have a symbol. Yes. They have a color. Yes. They have a branding. Why are you going to make us take away our brand? Which represents who we are. Come on, sir. Jesus. The oil is on you, man of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Ooh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, mm, mm. We give you glory, Lord. Hallelujah! Who 
Woo, glory to God. He's in this place. You talk about Jesus, he come on in. I said he's in the building. I said he's in the building. See, this is when you know it's a real church, when you can talk about Jesus and the church go up. Oh, somebody shout in this place for the name Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. oh Jesus. He's a real deal. Glory to God. Somebody praise Jesus. Oh! It gets down in your bones when you talk about Jesus. Can't nothing change it. Can't no culture change it. Can't no society change it. When you say for real, you just say for real. The cross done helped everybody in here. We can't take the cross away. Oh! If you're happy about the cross, just take off Holly. Come on, church! Come on, church! Hey! Shama never higher behind. The cross in Hebrew is called fire pit. That cross burned up iniquity out of you. We can't let it go. Hey, God! Thank you for the blood, for the cross. Set on down. Woo! Yes, Jesus. Come on, Bishop Sion. And say what? <laughs> we in there now, y'all. Ain't no sense of having no lecture. We might as well go on praise. Shut up, I never Show my son Woo! Deliverance need to come back to the church. Power need to come back to the church. When we mention the name Jesus, lies on a change. Somebody open your mouth and cry. Jesus. Son of the living God. Get down all in your belly. Have a shelter. It changed me, rearranged me, made me new. Not what I used to be. Don't go where I used to go. Don't talk like I used to talk. Because Jesus is on the inside of me. He is my culture. Somebody come on and shout one more time. Everybody shout. Let the world know that we still got a praise. How? Let the church go up. Somebody grab your neighbor's hand and just run back and start praising God. I feel a stirring in this place. Can't not stop the move of God that he's releasing today. Come on, he's doing something in the region. He never calls a move of God. Heaven is what's not about for us to sit here and be idle. But he calls it for us to get change in the region. Somebody shout! Promoting his name. We got to move. I got to move. Oh, Y'all sit on down. We give him glory. We give him glory. 
And you know what? Christianity is a culture. It is a culture. It's a way of life for us. Amen. Oh, that might be somebody that need deliverance right now while the power is in this place. Y'all might need prayer some. Y'all need to come on down here to this altar. Come on. Come on down here. Come on, let's work, panelists. Hey, hey. Somebody needs some help to be stirred again. Come on down here. Hey, Shabbat. Don't be afraid. Come on down here. It's power at this altar. The altar is for the saints. Come on down. Come on down. Y'all run to this altar. Come on here. Hey, glory. Hey, glory. I feel the power in here. Hey, glory. Somebody might need prayer. Come on, lift your hands and worship. <laughs> 